Hello and welcome everyone to our July SciCommerce Mentor Chat. Um, this month we are joined by Rose Rimler, who's a producer at the Science Versus podcast. Um, we're also joined by two special guests, Ben Rush and Sadie Wachowski, who are fellow SciCommerce. Um, ben and Sadie run um, the peer-led podcast club that's part of the SciCommerce Slack. Um, and this month they will be um, leading the conversation with Rose, which is very lucky for me because I've got COVID and the best of me is not here, y'all. <laughs> so I'm going to turn the floor over to Ben and Sadie, um, and then I'll just be back at the end for um, some SciCommer um, updates for you guys. Uh, ben and Sadie, the floor is yours. Fantastic. Go for it. Okay, I just want to go ahead and uh, let everybody know. So kind of the structure we have for this is we did um, start with some basic outlines of questions, but we really want to encourage uh, participation. So if you have any questions that you want to ask Rose, we're going to definitely save time at the end. Um, so you can shoot those questions to um, either Ben or I in the chat, and we'll make sure that you get a chance to ask them later on. So go ahead, Ben. Oh, I was just going to also add, uh, Tyler, I don't think we can ever get to your level anyways, um, even if you have COVID. So you're you're safe. We're not going to take your spot. But we are very excited to have uh, Rose here. I, both Sadie and I are podcasters, uh, in addition to being scientists in the past time. So this is quite an honor. And thanks for everyone for joining us today. Yeah. Um, well, Rose, I want to start and see if you wanted to introduce yourself and say anything to, to kick things off or share any clips maybe from uh, Science Versus. Sure. Um, yeah, I'm Rose Rimler. I'm a producer at Science Versus. I've been with the show um, since 2017 when I started as an intern, actually. I'll kind of talk about that process if you, or that path, if that's interesting. Um, and I... Uh, well, Gimlin is not owned by Spotify. Um, so that's a big change that happened since I started with the show. Um, but we are now on season 13. Um, we're producing that now. Um, if you guys are, I don't know if you're familiar, but the show has um, two seasons a year. We do a lot of like myth busting, a lot of like looking at the science behind everyday topics or things that are trending, we do tons of COVID stuff. People begged us to stop. Um, uh, we're working on a monkey fox episode now. Um, so we do things as they come up in the, in, um, in the world, but, um, then we do lots of sort of evergreen topics. We do a lot of like diets, keto diet, or those are always really popular. Um, I, and then we do stories, um, sort of science stories that aren't necessarily versusing anything. We're kind of branched out from that a little bit as the show has matured. So I've done some, um, some storytelling, like how did the history of science episodes, and those are really fun too. So, and I, I did bring some. Um, so, if if you guys are interested in like uh, writing, um, how making a podcast is different from a science podcast is different from um, writing science, like science communication, written versus audio. I have tons of thoughts on that. I started out um, in a, in the written form, um, and then went into podcasting, and I'm still. Five years in, I'm still making that transition. It's really hard, um, but I we do have like um, we've collected some examples of of um, getting good tape that I think might be useful for sharing. So I don't know, Sadie and Ben, if you want me to, I have I have a little bit of a spiel. I could do my spiel, or would you rather that come up organically? I don't know if you guys want to start asking questions or. Um, why don't we start with like a little bit of like background learning of how you got into podcasting in particular, and then we'll move into some of the more like creative choices and building the flow within a podcast. Does that work for you? Sure. Yeah. Um, I got into podcasting because I, I really like science writing. Well, I got into science writing because I was in science. I um, got a master's degree in marine biology from the University of Oregon. And then um, I ended up getting a fellowship, the um, AAAS Mass Media Fellowship in 2015 and they placed me at a newspaper in um, Raleigh, North Carolina. And I was their sole <laughs> science and environment reporter for the summer, which was great for me. I could had free reign. I produced a lot of clips, sad for the state of the world that they don't have a full-time science and environment reporter, but that's another story. Um, so that was my first professional experience was um, writing for the newspaper. 
and loved it completely addictive um really one of the most exciting jobs I, i'd ever had and so when that ended i was very fortunately armed with tons of clips which in my experience has been like the thing it's one of those things like you need the experience to get the job to get more experience so that was one great thing about i think the fellowship or you could probably do that via internship or something like that as well um and uh so then i started freelance writing for healthline um which at the time was i think a little bit less well known i think they've done a good job for themselves they said that when i was writing for them they said that they thought, thought themselves as a competitor to webmd and i was like yeah right but i think actually now they are i think they've they've come a long way um but i that was a good experience i wrote about one article a week for them um it wasn't enough to support myself financially i was waiting tables that whole time um and i had pretty low cost of living i was living in portland oregon that helped um so then that was great but you know kind of freelance writing is a little scary um and then i got a job um uh writing for a, a medical trade magazine which i think is a really interesting source of potential science writing jobs i like that too i was writing for doctors um sleep doctors it was a, a magazine called sleep review so it was like for doctors that do sleep medicine a lot of cpaps sleep apnea but other kinds of things so that was a challenge like you know writing for people who are more educated than i am about something i i like that the only problem with all these jobs is that they were very solitary. Um particularly the healthline writing for healthline and and also writing for the magazine it was just me and my editor and the editor did very light editing and said okay and and there wasn't really any kind of like teamwork or collabor collaborative effect and um and I thought to myself I don't know if I can do this as a career if I'm just going to be in a room by myself you know quietly working and and I don't know what my future is if the, if this is how it's got has to be and I thought well maybe there's some form of science writing that or science communication that is more collaborative and I thought maybe multimedia so um podcasting or writing for TV like Nova or something I was like maybe that's like maybe that would be more of a teamwork thing and that's how I ended up uh, applying to be an intern at Science Versus. I didn't really have, like a lot of people at Gimlet have this like love and passion for audio. And do I, I don't know that I, I'm one of those people. I certainly have a lot of respect for audio. And I, and I just, when it's done well, I think that's amazing. I like, I love This American Life. You know, I've been listening to Radio, uh, radio Lab my whole life, basically. But that's not exactly why I started doing this. It wasn't like, oh, I think the best medium is audio. I, I don't think that, but um. I thought the work experience might be better. And actually that's proved to be true. Um, at least for the show I work at, we have a really nice teamwork um, atmosphere and that's been much more sustainable, I think. Um, so that's to say that you've then, you you went from intern to editor, correct? Have you had any other positions with Science Versus? Uh, I'm not an editor, I'm a producer. Right. What's yeah. the difference for people who don't know? It's, it's totally varies um, for at our show. Um, we have one editor, uh, Blythe, um, the difference is that typically the editor doesn't make the show, doesn't do the interviews, doesn't do the primary research, doesn't pitch stories. And that's all stuff that the producer does, um, on our show, we all do a little bit of everything, but each producer takes on a few different episodes to be the lead on. Um, so if it's my, I'm the lead producer on an episode, I'm doing most of the preliminary research, reading a lot, lots of papers, interviewing, pre-interviewing scientists, doing a lot of like that legwork. And then, um, and then I collaborate with the editor and other people on the show to um, kind of get guidance. Like, okay, I, the, the episode maybe could look like this, beat, beat one, beat two, beat three. And here are some of the scientists I think we should interview for it what do you think? Or, you know, they'll help you shape the, the direction of the show. It's like very bird's eye view when they don't have the like invest emotional investment that you might have. Like, oh, I love so-and-so. I have to have them on the show. But then the editor hears the tape and says, so-and-so is not very interesting to me. So um, cut, you know? Uh, so they do a lot of like top-down kind of um, advice. And and then on our show, the editor helps us write the script at the very last stages. So we write it together, but that's probably unusual. I think. So I wanna ask one other question about kind of how you learned and in getting into podcasting. Um, you have this background in science writing, which 
you know, your podcast is scripted, but this is still, it's a different medium. So are there specific resources or like tools that you use to kind of help this transition from just expecting someone to read your written word to really needing to, you know, get across emotion and humor and things through an audio medium instead? Resources, that's a great question. Um, there's a, um, there's a podcast about podcasting, um, believe it or not, it's called, um, by the guys at Transom. Are you guys familiar with Transom? Um, that's good to listen to, I think. I listen to it. Um, it's a different topic every time. If I'll remember it and I'll, I'll, I'm sure in another minute or so. Um, Gimlet also has produced um, a couple of like training podcasts that you could listen to that I could share. Um, I wanna say it's called like Gimlet Academy. And I think that's widely available um, and some really good lessons there. But, you know, personally, it's been a lot of um, trial and error and, um, you know, I work with some really excellent um, podcast people with more experience than me. So just mentorship by Wendy, who's our host, um, and just trying a lot of things that didn't work, you know, is mostly how I learned. Um, oh, yeah, that looks like it. That's right. Yeah, I'll think about it for other other resources for learning to podcast, but those are two really good ones. Um, yeah, I can't remember the name of the Transom podcast, but I give them Academy is good. It's like four or five episodes. And so, yeah, the first one's about how to pitch. Number three, now that's good tape. That's, if you listen to only that one, if you listen to only one, maybe that's the one to listen to. Good tape is like, is something we think about every day. It's rules my life. Um, the search for a good tape has completely overtaken my professional life for the last five years, which is the big difference, in my opinion, um, writing for um, uh, making a podcast versus writing an article. So, Rose, a while ago, you mentioned uh, doing a lot of science communication, being isolated, then you were an intern within a team, and now you're a team within a whole company. Could you speak on the workflow within your team and how that might interact with the, with Gimlet in general? Sure. Um, it doesn't interact that much with Gimlet in general. We're kind of siloed. Um, I think that's true for a lot of teams in Gimlet. It might be true for other podcasts. It's hard to say, um, but I wouldn't be surprised. It's um, uh, Our workflow is that we're a team of about five people. It fluctuates, but typically about five um, full-time people. And um, we all have pitch meetings before the season starts. We'll have usually two or three. And we come in with these ideas that we've kind of done about half the research. We would quarter of the research. We Well, I don't know about that. We've done some research um, enough to say like, here's what I, here's some interesting science about this topic. Here's why I think the topic is timely or um, why the topic is interesting. Um, and here's a, uh, some ideas about maybe some of the talent we'd have on the show. So just, we all kind of like evaluate that pitch together and come up with ideas together and maybe it'll be greenlit right away. Great, let's make it, you know, go forth. And, or maybe it'll be kind of like a yellow light, like mm, maybe this will work, but first you have to find out X, Y, Z, do a little, little more research. Um, it's rarely like straight up red lit, <laughs> that does happen. Um, so then, uh, yeah, as I said, everybody's responsible for their, for a few of their own episodes. And, um, we got, uh, some time before the season starts to start working on that. And then we continue to work on the episodes while we're in season. So things ramp up and they get a little bit more intense, like early season. Um, and then week of publish, we have a very specific workflow. So, well, between the pitch and we could publish, there's a bunch of edits that we do. So we do like a table read. We'll play the tape and um, and read our scripts. We'll do at least two or three of those and we get feedback. Um, and we might go back to the drawing board. We might totally change the structure of the episode around. That's one thing the editor is really helpful for. Like, okay, you know, do talk about this point, then this point, then this point, or switch the order of the tape. Um, or sometimes it's more small tweaks, but by the week of publish, we come out, the episode comes out on Thursdays. So the Friday before, so about a week before, um, we record a scratch track. So I might, let's say it's Wendy's hosting the episode, but I might, I'm writing it. So I'll 
I'll record a version of myself running through it with all the tape played. And then Monday morning, first thing in the morning, everyone listens to the scratch track and um, puts in notes, puts in comments. And then we write, we listen to everybody's comments. And then um, I and Wendy, or maybe Wendy and Blythe, our editor, will write through the whole thing, um, rewrite the whole thing. We record a scratch a scratch track on Monday night. Everybody listens, or not everybody, but at least a few people on the show. Some people on the show listen again, Tuesday morning, comments, edits. We write through it again, rewrite the whole thing as much as it needs. Um, record uh, more officially. One day's then is like laying down the tracking, which is sort of like the official narration. Um, we make sure the tape is like as good as it can be. Then we start sending it to the edit, the engineer who will kind of be making the, doing things to the tape. I don't really understand to make it smoother starting to add music, starting to do stuff like that. We hear a version on Wednesday morning. Some people, not everyone on the team, but a few people will listen and then put their notes in, we rewrite. By Thursday morning, we're doing that again, but hopefully we have very few rewrites in a perfect world. Um, the same thing, during this time, we have a, a, an independent fact checker who is outside Gimlet. Um, they work freelance and uh, we have a few really excellent fact checkers we work with. They're going through the scripts and they are, um, double checking all of our citations and seeing if we're missing citations. Like we can't just say there's a hundred elephants in the world, you know, and there's no citation. Like she'll like, you need a citation. Are there really a hundred elephants in the world? Um, so that's going on too. So when we're rewriting, we're adjusting for whatever the fact checker flags, we're adjusting for aesthetics. Um, we're making structural changes that people have suggested or we feel like it's not working where sometimes that's where the humor comes in because we didn't have time to be funny before and then we're adding jokes and stuff. So, and then it's published on Thursday. Uh, yeah, I'm uh, kind of exhausted thinking about the whole process right now. Um, so kudos to you and the team being able to do that for every single episode. Do yeah, you so think there, like as let's say like season 12 is being released, you're starting to work on and pitch ideas for season 13. Um, is it seems like it's pretty variable, but do you do you think there's like an average of how long an episode takes from start to publishing? It is variable, but one that's not super newsy, like a monkeypox episode, um, like three months, two or three months. Yeah. And then co some of the COVID ones we did in a few days, but that's that's COVID. Yeah. So we've kind of talked about what that process looks like if you're working at like an official podcasting studio. Um, but I'm kind of curious about the creative choices that you get to make when you're thinking about telling a science story using audio. So um, what are you, what are your kind of the, the challenges that you have to overcome when you're doing this, especially like, you know, does your editorial team come back and say like, this isn't going to catch people's interest. You need to tell the story differently. Are there certain, you know, metaphors or analogies that you really have to lean on? Are there things like that? Yeah. Um, yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of like editing things like we hear over and over again. Um, get here faster. That's a comment I see a lot. Too long winded, in other words, or like there's a fun piece of tape he here and there's this much of the script to wade through to get to it. And it's like, no, just just get here faster. That's the how can you get there faster? Because you're you're losing our attention, basically. Um Signposting, have you guys ever heard that term? A lot of that, that comes up a lot, like need signposting. So that the idea is like, tell me where we're going, signpost. Um, and that's something you do more in audio writing than you probably would for, for writing writing because people's attention is often split when they're, we, we just process information differently when we hear it. So. I might not need you to, I might not need a, a writer and a written piece to say like, next we're gonna talk about whether or not exercise helps us cure cancer. You know, I'm like, you don't need to tell me that. It's like kind of bad writing almost, but in a podcast, it can be helpful because um, you just, a lot of people are like washing the dishes when they listen or they're driving or, you know, you can't flip the page back and remind yourself where we are. So signposting. Um, and then sometimes like we have dummy signposts, like I don't know a clever way to write this um, or a clever transition, like how to transition between points in a, in a sort of natural way. Like I don't have that writing in my head right now. So I'm just gonna write like 
transition, he, or uh, even like literally, here is where we have transitional writing, or here is a signpost. The next thing we're going to talk about is blah, blah, blah. And so that sort of reminds you to, to slow down a little bit and, and eventually you'll figure something out. Well, I think we're at a good spot to hopefully listen to some clips that you brought. Um, we wanted to make sure we had a little time to discuss your personal editorial things, things that you're proud of, things that maybe you want to improve. Uh, listen back to them now. Hopefully um, it would be nice and easy to share. Yeah, let me see. I mean, I think it might be as simple as I just play it out loud on my speakers and the speakers pick them up well enough for you to hear. That's what we usually do for edits. Um, so we'll see. My um, So I would say that, I would say the good tape rules my life. Um, how do you get good tape? Um, or, or maybe I should start with why does good tape rule my life? Because, and this took me a long time to accept, but like at our show at least, and, and any show can be different, but at our show, it's the tape that drives the story. So um, in a written piece, you know, it's like, but I have the, I have a beautiful writer. I, I could say it so well, like I can come up with a great analogy for, you know, um, how um, the monkeypox virus breaks into a cell or whatever. But it's not like this show is about the scientists giving you that information um, and the personality of the scientists and the behind the scenes of science. And so we want to get that great stuff from the, the person we're interviewing. Um, and so now actually when I write a draft of an episode, I start with the tape. I gather, I have an idea about like how I think the episode will go. And I, then I interview people with that in mind. And then I go through the tape and I pull the best pieces of, um, of our interview, selects we call them. And then I will arrange those selects by sort of topic about roughly, you know, where, what they're talking about. And then I, right around them so like I, all that tape is like guiding the whole draft and then I just write sentences in between where I really need where they're really like very economically like what's the least writing that needs to happen here and that is how I have the most successful drafts um as opposed to starting with like my writing and then trying to sandwich in the tape I got starting with the tape and sandwiching in my own writing um so if I don't have good tape to work with it's terrible <laughs> but so how do you get good tape um you pick the people you interview very carefully. Um, you know, you do your best. Like it's tr tricky because we want to have people who are experts in often very particular things. We may not have a ton of options in the field or people don't get back to you who you think would be great or you don't have a lot of time and, you're, you know, but um, we do try to like pick people who are good talkers or sort of natural storytellers who speak with emotion or not monotonous. Um, and uh, and especially if they're like kind of game to play along, like they won't get annoyed if you ask them to repeat something or come up with an analogy. Um, so we try to find the best talkers we can. Then there's the, given that, then you've got whoever you're interviewing and we do a lot of like poking and prodding people. Um, this is hard for me. I'm very polite. So I like naturally don't want to don't like to poke and prod, but that's kind of what you have to do. And, and I think other people on the team are especially good at this. And actually the example I have is um, an interview Marilyn Wendy did. Um, they pulled this as sort of a teaching moment. So this is from an episode um, that we produced about um, exercise. What is it good for? Because exercise is not particularly linked to, to losing weight. Most people think when they think of why should I get exercise, they might think it's for weight control, but it's actually the, the evidence is not really there that you're going to lose weight if you if you exercise. So that's an interesting thing that we won't kind of wanted to bite our teeth into. And then another thing in the episode we wanted to, to explore was like, then what is exercise good for? So there's this beat about um, the section of the episode um, about how exercise um, reduces people's risk of cancer. So in this example, Wendy and Merrill are trying to, um, are interviewing a researcher who studies exercise and cancer. So I'll, I'll play, this is attempt one. I think the question was like, I'm not sure the question's in there or not, but it's like, why, why does exercise, what, how does it work? Why would exercise um, kill cancer cells? Natural killer cell. Can you hear it? Okay. So here's her first attempt. Natural killer cells, they're constantly on patrol looking for cells um, and in contact with cells. And so 
um, they have activating and inhibitory receptors on their surface. Um, and they basically look at other cells and determine if they're self or not. Um, and most cells express these receptors called MHC1 receptors, and this marks cells as self. Um, many cancer cells lose their MHC1 receptors, and so it leaves them vulnerable to being killed by a natural killer cell. So when the cell, when the natural killer cell sees one of these cells that is cancerous, um, it decides to kill it. Um, and in that process, it releases uh, cytotoxic granules that basically cause that other cell to rupture. What do you guys think of that, Tate? There's a lot of cells and self, and they sound really similar. And if you're not paying attention, you get lost. And it sounds like I'm in a lecture. Yeah, it's very technical. So go, okay, we'll get someone outside. Um, jargony, jargony. And I, I was glazed over. And I have, a, I have a background in biology, so it's too much even for me. And if someone who's listening who does not want to go back to biology class will tune out. So here's our second attempt. What, what, what is happening in my blood when I say I go for a run? And, and Meryl is doing like a, a, an interview trick, which is to make it more personal. Like, okay, so her natural explanation was a little jargony. How can I make it like, how can I suggest to her? She thinks um, she, how can we get it a different way? So we do often do that. Like ima imagine I'm a cell and I'm floating. I don't know. So it, she's trying like a trick here. Right. So. Um, the idea is that exercise has many effects on the immune system. One effect is that it increases the circulating level. And the second pathway is IL-6 dependent, where it takes those could cells from the bloodstream just... and moves them to the tumor. Sorry, could we, um, I'm not sure if we'll actually get into that much detail for the episode. Uh, could we maybe just keep it vague? Like, I did like it when you said explode. <laughs> maybe you could just say that last part if, um, before when we're using the, the person analogy. Right. Um, so once the natural killer cell identifies a cancer cell, it decides to kill it and it releases chemicals that cause that cell to explode. A little better towards the end. And what Meryl did was a technical interview trip, um, in technical interview trick um, that we call interrupting, um, which is sometimes necessary. Okay, here's a third attempt because that, that was a little better, but we didn't get much. Is it changed like when you're when you're doing your run and you're running like full speed towards the trash can? Are you thinking about like get those cancer cells? Yeah, I think like learning more about how exercise impacts cancer and the potential mechanisms of the relationship really is helpful in my own exercise and helping me to feel more confident that doing exercise actually has all of these benefits. Um, physiologically as well as emotionally. Oh, so it does. You do. You are thinking about your research sometimes when you're exercising. <laughs> I think about it a lot when I'm exercising. Really? <laughs> it's hard to separate my research life from my personal life. So yes, um, especially when exercising, it's like both of the worlds come together. What are you picturing? Like when you're on the, that <laughs> run, like it's like, this army like coming to life what is it how would you picture it um I mean I think it's like your body is reacting um in a positive way to the exercise so all of these systems are working for you um when you're exercising to reduce your risk of disease and so um I kind of just picture you know your body working for you like an army um to help you combat disease including cancer So now I'll play you um, the final version that we use in the episode. So once the natural killer cell identifies a cancer cell, it decides to kill it and it releases chemicals 
that caused that cell to explode or rupture. That's, I mean, it's so cool. I know there's like lots of potential mechanisms, but this one is particularly cool. Yeah, I think it's really great. When you're when you're doing your run and you're running like full speed, are you thinking about like, get those cancer cells? <laughs> I think about it a lot when I'm exercising. Really? I kind of just picture, you know, your body working for you like an army to help you combat disease, including cancer. Pretty cool. So we use very little of that very technical stuff. And one reason is that we are probably better at writing that than she is at explaining it off the cuff. Um, and we can do that in our writing. What she can give us that we can't, that we need from her is her, her emotions as a cancer researcher, her un unique perspective, her personal experience. Um, and if she can do a great explanation about how cancer cells work, that's great. Um, but we can work with less, if that makes sense, and, and put in the technical details are in our own way in the writing. Is that the mindset you're, you're going in with that, you know, 80% of the technical writing will be done by the GIMA team, or, sorry, by Science Versus team, regardless, and then a bonus if we get really good technical explanations, but we mostly want to capture like the, the human side of the scientist? Yes and no. I mean, we always want to get like, a good explanation of the science from the scientists. Um, we start, we go into interviews with uh, bullet points of uh, what we call must gets. So you don't want to leave the interview without these three or four must gets. And they're usually um, visual, sort of like some describing descriptions that are visual, um, a story. Um, uh, yeah, I don't, it's hard to say. I think we do, we would really like to get a great technical explanation. Well, it, you know, technical is always going to be kind of boring, but like a great analogy from the, from the um, scientists is really, is really useful tape. Um, sometimes we get that by offering a really bad analogy just so that they'll correct it with a better one. So, you know, you could say like, oh, is it kind of like, um, you know, is it is it kind of like when you go to the circus and there's a bunch of clowns in a clown car and they'll be like, no, it's not, no, it's it's more like um, when you go to the zoo and then there's an elephant, you know, I don't know why all my hypotheticals involve elephants today, but um, so there's a lot of like stuff you can try. You can also level with people. I mean, we're not trying to trick anyone. It's just like, just people get a little nervous and um, there's different ways to kind of break them out of that shell. Um, but sometimes it works just be like, our audience won't understand that. Um, I think Meryl kind of did that in one, like that's too technical. Like how would you, well, one we use a lot, how would you explain it to, um, um, your kid or your nephew, you know, um, that often works. How would you explain it to a friend at the bar? Um, yeah, but it's the best, the best to get is like emotional. And I don't mean crying. I'm just like, excited or, or, you know, with it, you know, engaged. I've also found uh, my analogies, especially as elephants as clowns are pretty effective, no matter yeah. what. <laughs> um, my last question for you, and I'll, I'll turn it back to Sadie. Are there clips um, that you're particularly proud of, of getting from scientists or uh, some, you know, going to the other side, is there something that's out in the world that you really wish you'd have another version of, of taking? Mm. Oh, I'm very proud of an episode that I was the lead producer on called um, Hunt for an Invisible Killer. It's a story about finding a copy or finding a sample of the original 1918 flu virus um, that caused that pandemic. And I, I think it turned out great. And one thing I, that I'm, it makes me feel good about it is it was just great to interview this man who um, was 95 when I interviewed him. Um, he, he happened to live in the my dad's neighborhood where I was spending some time during COVID. So he was like my neighbor, and he um, he had gone in his youth, is like a, in the in his 20s, in the 50s, 1950s. He had gone to Alaska to see if he could find preserved bodies um, who were victims of the flu, who were buried but intact. If he could um, get permission to go into a grave and take a sample and, and then try to, cult and that in the fifties, it was like to um, culture the virus and figure out what it was because nobody knew 
exactly what that was that had killed so many people because it was before virology really um and didn't work you know when he tried in the in the 50s he was able to get a sample but he couldn't cultivate it and then he went back after um uh like in the 90s he went back um and as an old man he was in his 70s at that point and anyway so it, it's a great story and um Oh, thanks so much. Yeah. And so part of it was a serendipity that this person lived like, oh, I could have walked to his house for my dad. This is so weird. But also they're just such delight. He and his wife were delightful. And I also really, really did not want to make that episode without having some of the um, the native peoples of the Alaskan village where that happened without their voices in it. And we, I was able to talk to a number of people and um, interview two, um, some of who used some of the tape in the episode. Um, and uh that was an interesting side of the story and um yeah and get it, it wasn't exactly the episode i had planned i wanted to do a whole thing about how then the cdc they used the the code of the virus to um res they made it in the lab like they had the the dna the sequence um from johan the adventurer and and this other guy jeffrey Talbenberger, and, and some of his collaborators but then the cdc like made the virus again in the lab and was this like high high security thing where this it, only one guy was allowed to like work on it and he had to like live by himself for or, like the time he was working on it so just in case and I thought that was really interesting but he wouldn't I couldn't get him to respond to me so it wasn't the episode I had envisioned but in the end it, it turned out really well um and he's Johan died recently so that was and you know that was a just really good luck that good timing um episodes I I, I feel really weird thinking about the opioid addiction episode we did. I didn't feel great about that. Um, I don't think anything we said was wrong, but I think maybe I just wasn't like mature enough to make it. That was one of the first episodes I made for the show. Um, I don't, and it's hard to say what exactly we did wrong. I think, I well, I know what we did wrong. We came off in that episode as um, dismissive of AA and 12-step programs. Um, that wasn't my intention because there is good science that those programs really help people. Um, but we were exploring like uh, it, for opioid addi addiction specifically, there's a lot of um, research that suggests people are much more successful if they're on something called like, uh, I think it's called buprenorphine. buprenorphine. Um, so it's a it's an opioid agonist that, that kind of like a methadone. Um, so we were kind of focusing on that, like, you know, people think that you have to quit cold turkey and, but for opioid addiction, it might be a different story. So that was, and the, and we had an anecdote from someone who had, what had, had an opioid addiction and didn't do well in AA, but, but then we said like, so we told his personal story, but then we said, but the research says that that's not true for everyone. Blah, blah, blah. And then people wrote to us or, or pointed out like, Hey, they thought we were saying AA didn't work. And I was like, no, we said AA did work. Why would you think that? And I realized it's because the personal anecdote is what sticks. It's not the like few sentences of like, but a meta-analysis found do -do -do. So his experience wasn't universal. Um, that was a, a lesson to learn. It's like, you cannot have someone's personal anecdote conflict with the science and think that you can get away with it. It's too confusing and it doesn't stick. It's definitely, it's definitely all like a learning process as you go and you're like, oh, I wish I could go back in time and redo these ones that now I know exactly how I'd want to structure it. And we do um, rerun episodes and we update them. So I, maybe I'll have my chance. Oh, I don't really want it. I don't want to do it. It's so, <laughs> it's so much, but yeah, maybe I will someday. Well, so thinking about kind of podcasting broadly, are there shows that you listen to that particularly inspire you? Are there ones that are like totally outside of, you know, science podcasting that you really like and, and you pull ideas from as well? Uh, it's a good question. Um, it's such a, it's such a generic answer, but every time I listen to This American Life, I'm like, those guys know what they're doing. It's just remarkable. And I also like, it's another Gimlet show, but, um, do you guys know Heavyweight? Um, and that's an example of a show that really does employ writing. It's not, it's tape driven as well. They, they have great tape and they use it well, but they also have really really a unique voice the narrator has a very unique voice and his writing is really makes it pop um so I admire that those two a lot but they're not yeah um I have to say lately I've been listening to a lot of like just crummy celebrity gossip podcasts which are not inspiring they just <laughs> just to turn my brain off 
I will say my old college roommate is the host of Normal Gossip. And so when I'm listening, I feel oh, really? like I'm in my living room again. Yeah, it's very weird. Oh, wild. Yeah. Well, if you guys want to put in the chat some of your favorites, especially science podcasts, I'm always looking for recommendations because you get kind of narrow. So I'd love to hear what you guys are listening to. Well, I want to ask one last question about um, kind of just your journey and like where are there particular areas that you're hoping to explore in the future in, in terms of types of stories or storytelling techniques at Science Versus? And then we're going to do a very um, flash round of like technical questions for people who are looking oh. at this podcast. Sure. Um, so what am I, what do I want to do in the future? Um, I have a dream of following a science court case. So, and that might take years to really do it, but um, like from the ground up. So if there's like a, a legal battle that where science is involved, um, I'm thinking of, and it's too late because it's it's over and done with, but there was, um, there's a case in Italy about 10 years ago, some geologists said there would not, there were a lot of um, pre-shocks. There are a lot of like earth, mini earth, small earthquakes. And these geologists um, said there will not be a major earthquake. And there was a major earthquake and the government sued them. And one person was convicted of like for two years in prison for like, you know, not producing an earthquake. That's not exactly what happened, but that's how it was reported. Um, so that kind of thing interests me, like science on trial. And it would be really interesting to follow the whole case, kind of like the staircase, but for science. I think that would be really that's something I, I have an ambition to do someday, maybe. I'm excited to see what you turn out. Yeah, that I'm having a hard time wrapping my head around like predicting things and having that. It's like in my publications, we're not predict, predicting events, but like we're using equations to predict health outcomes. Um, and I don't want to go to jail for that. Um, yeah, that's not exactly what happened. It was more, it was like the communication was bad. Is, is more than yeah um so uh, yeah i was gonna ask the lightning round of just technical questions but i did see one question in the chat that i thought was uh really important to bring up uh someone was asking about the inclusion of voices that are usually underrepresented in science um mm -hmm. could you speak to maybe how science versus uh tries to get more voices from that angle and then also maybe choices uh when those uh, voices aren't available. Yeah, um, we talk about that a lot. We um, uh, set a goal, a standard for ourselves to pre, at least pre-interview, I don't know, as many as possible um, people of color um, for every episode. I think we say at least three, but usually we it's more than that. Um, and uh, and we kind of have a rule, I guess we do have a rule, it's an official rule that we will not have a person come on the show as a generalist, to sort of like, here's a general overview of a topic, who is a white man. Um, if, you know, there's a very specific paper we really want to talk about, like I did this episode on processed food and um, there's a randomized control trial where they brought people into a lab and fed them either processed food or whole foods. There's only one of those. And it was done by this guy, Kevin Hall, a white man. Um, if there's a, if there's a, it has to be a really, it has to be a good reason for those scientists we're interviewing to be neither a person of color nor um, female or, or gender non-conforming. Um, and we have tracked that. Um, well, it's probably time for us to do another round of that to see how we're doing. And um, I guess that's, I guess that's the answer answer and yeah it can be it can be really frustrating um and i get frustrated with myself for not doing a better job when um i'm i'm finding that i'm i'm speaking to a lot of white people um for an episode and then it usually means for broaden your um your uh the way you're looking like a lot of if i'm looking a lot i've noticed that a lot of the um you know on a paper there's like a contact this is the author to contact that's often the pi the pi is more likely to be um uh you know a white man and so look at the other names in the paper and then google them like what kinds of research do they do um reach out to them so that's been that's been one strategy yeah thanks for sharing your perspective on that um going to some quick lightning round questions and then we'll have a bit of time for folks in the audience to ask questions as well 
Uh, what software does the team use for editing audio? Pro Tools. Pro Tools. Okay. Industry standard. Uh, what software do you use for teamwork? Um, Google, uh, let's see, Google Docs for scripts, um, like a living document, and we share it on a Google Drive. Um, Slack for communication. That's it. Awesome. And we use Google Hangouts usually for team meetings. Okay, cool. Yeah, that's also good to know. Those are you know relatively cheap or free uh, for yeah. teams. That's great. Um, what microphone do you use? And do you send them to guests? Up here. Um, I use, this is a, I just got a mic stand like a, a month ago, believe it or not. Um, this is a Sennheiser, I think. Yeah, Sennheiser shotgun mic. And I've upset my cat. Um, yeah, it looks like this. And I, I can't figure out how to make this stand do what I want it to do. Um, I used to just hold it. I've, for like three years now, COVID, I finally got a stand. Um, and then I, I'll show you, I have a these Zoom recorders, which is a little confusing, Zoom recorder, Zoom meeting, but it's two different companies, but yeah, we use this Zoom recorder. And and we don't send kits to people we interview, we ask them to record themselves on their um, iPhone, on voice memo. So you've got that um, microphone, is that going directly into your Zoom as an audio interface? Yes, it plugs into the, um, the Zoom portable recorder, yeah. Gotcha. Um, do you really care about cameras? And if so, which camera do you use? Oh, you mean like over like a Zoom camera or? Yeah, I, I know I, I don't do this for my podcast and you know I don't listen to any podcasts that have video, but that's a thing that's happening. Uh, more are starting to kind of blur the line between YouTube and podcasts, but sometimes to include video. We don't do that. It would be really hard, I think, for us to do because we have we're not we don't like it's not chat. You know, like Joe Rogan can do that because he's just <laughs> pulling stuff out of wherever. Um, that's it's interesting. No, we don't. We haven't really considered doing that. Um, but we do. You know, as far as visuals go, we it took us a while, but we started sharing some visuals on Instagram, which has gotten a good response. But we haven't done any kind of like live. We did one Instagram live, me and Wendy once, but yeah. And it was fine. <laughs> um, it was, was kind of nice, but we just haven't done it again. So I don't know what that tells you. Okay. Well, that I'd ask. Um, do you, is your team working remotely at this point? Probably like a lot of, a lot of other podcasting teams. Yeah, we're all totally remote. Um, we keep saying, well, those of us who are still in New York or still in Brooklyn will go into the office once a week, and we don't always do that. The office is still there, so we could. Okay, my last lightning round question. If there's uh, someone you could meet in the podcasting world, who would you want to meet? Who would just blow you away? Oh, uh... Well, it's funny because I think this person might be at Gimlet. Um, did you guys ever listen to um, Appearances? Sharon Mashihi? It's kind of like, it's not a science at all, but um, it's a fictionalized um, sort of memoir podcast. Um, Appearances is the name and I recommend it. And I just was really impressed by what she made. And I saw her once her name popped up at like a Gimlet all staff. And I was like, Sharon Mashihi works here. But I, and I'm too, I'm too shy to slack her. I'm not even sure she's still here. I don't know which project she was on, but that was pretty cool. Okay. Yeah, thanks for sharing. Um, at this time, we'll just open up to everyone. If you want to drop your questions right in the chat, we can make sure um, we get that. Uh, Sadie, how do you, I feel like we have a small enough group, maybe we can just have people um, raise their hands and then they can unmute themselves and, and chat. Yeah, I agree. Raise your, yeah. Um, looks like Monica just raised her hand first, so we'll let Monica ask her question first. Uh, yeah, because I'm a Black woman scientist, so when you were discussing that, I was kind of saying it, one difficulty in finding us, because there's there's quite, there's more of us here than when I first started. Um, mm -hmm is especially since 2020, we tend to view research and science a little differently. Mm -hmm. uh, because traditionally like research for like conferences for 
poster presentations, for peer review, it's not keeping us alive. So you'll mm -hmm. find a lot of us are sort of pushing back against that whole like research for research sake and mm -hmm. research for like social justice purpose purposes and looking at data gaps, looking at missing data, asking different data questions, HMS principles, community engagement, making sure marginalized communities are involved in the scientific process in academia differently instead mm -hmm. of necessarily just doing the academic way, which is very harmful for mm -hmm. um, mar many marginalized communities. So I was just gonna suggest that maybe if, if you reframe what, what is science supposed to do? Mm -hmm. What is this information for? Mm -hmm. How is it helping make the place, you know, community, society a better place? It may be easier to find us because I, just from our conversations, we're kind of tired of the, oh, I published a paper, but, we're still dying, you know, just kind of that balance of like, good, it's on your CV, but the cops are still killing our community. So that may be something to, to talk about or, or just reframe when you're looking for scientists is maybe look at like data for black lives. I've been into just quite a few, a growing group of us who are kind of pushing back against traditional academia, traditional science and saying it's time for science to do this now instead of discussing a paper or a protocol or methodology but thank, thank you for you. being here no oh, thank you very much i appreciate that yeah i think that makes sense to me and, yeah and another thing um is we um reach out to um uh organizations and fellowships there's a lot of like um uh you know, I'm trying to think of an example, but I'm blanking. Um, uh, I can't think of an example, but there's like, uh, oh, there's like uh, black and marine science, for example. I reached out to them to to look for an expert on um, on something. So I we do that a lot, and that has actually been very fruitful, as opposed to just like looking at the mastheads on papers and stuff. Looks like we got another question. Um, go ahead. <laughs> I don't know, it looks like it says Sadie and I'm like, that's my It is. Oh. And when I see every time I hear your name, I'm like, huh? Huh? <laughs> the cocktail phenomenon. I'm like bugging out. Um, Rose, thank you so much for everything that you've shared today, including your personal story. Um, my question is one that you or my fellow Sadie or Ben, um, all three of you might might know more. And it's about the industry standard to date, I guess, about um podcasts and whether. Um, guests are compensated, if that's a conversation that's happening, particularly for people of color, for indigenous voices, um, for underrepresented um, communities, because there does tend to be an overburdening of these voices, especially for niche areas, right? So if there's like a particular area and this is the person, everyone comes to that person. And while we want to represent that voice, it can be it can, it can be just overwhelming, I imagine, for a lot of those voices. So if you're able to provide any insights on sort of what the, the status, the, you know, status of, of that is, and if there's any movement towards changing that or challenging that. That's a good question, yeah. When we invite people on as experts, we don't offer any uh, payment. That comes from a history of journalistic practice that this should probably be re-examined. Um, I think the thinking is if uh, you're paying someone, you may not get, they might think that they have to tell you what you want to hear or something. You may not get, um, it's like an inappropriate relationship, I think. Um, when we, ha we do hire consultants sometimes, people to consult on the show. Um, especially if we're discussing a community that's not represented on our staff um, and we pay uh, people for that. But, and then we also sometimes have sort of like non-academic, non-expert people, but people who come on the show to tell their stories and we don't pay them. And that's an interesting question. It's never come up, I don't think. Um, I'm curious what what Ben and Sadie would say about that if you've ever I haven't heard I haven't heard of a movement to do that but I could be missing it no I I think I agree because there is this idea of like 
And you see it a lot in uh, creative fields of like, oh, you're being paid for your time and exposure, which is kind of bogus. Um, but in terms of like experts being brought onto shows, I think there is this worry that like by paying someone, they're being seen as like more of an op-ed type person. And that takes away from some of their expertise at some level. So I haven't seen any movement towards paying experts unless they're like a like a featured person almost on your staff that's like brought in for a season or something um i all the podcasting that i've done has been independent of any other university or backing so i don't make money at this point um i would i'd absolutely love to give all my guests at least some sort of compensation and i think the way besides monetarily that I've been able to offer is some exposure, which I feel like is, is traditional, but also if I can return the favor and say, hey, do you want um, help either communicating some of your science? Uh, do you want me to create certain edits of this podcast that you might be able to use uh, on your website or for personal promotion? So I think there's some other ways besides monetarily, um, but I think that'd probably be what people want more than anything else than just like a, a bit more like Twitter exposure. Um, and Monica, you have your hand up. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to say like one thing when we're using the term experts, I think we need to realize that there are experts who do not have PhDs or masters. Um, there are community experts, especially in marginalized communities where we do not have access to higher education. Um, and so I look at my doctorate and I say, I beat their system. You know, I have my three degrees. So I think with experts, there are community experts that can school me in some of the chemicals coming out of these toxic facilities. So we need to be careful with what we mean by that word, um, that it doesn't go with academia. And as far as money, I have heard that, but again, I'm a black woman because we, since 2020, especially, we have been doing so much emotional labor, trying to teach people to not be racist, do not be classist, do not, we're, we're giving, and then all of the wealth that was stolen from our ancestors, all of the knowledge, that was stolen from indigenous peoples and black people who were trafficked here and knowledge systems that we were struck, told to not do and is now being fed back to us through a white voice or you know through cultural appropriation there is a very we're very strong call from our end saying yes you do need to pay us um, because you've been profiting off of our knowledge for centuries and you're profiting off of our emotional labor and saying you all need to do better, um, for, you know, since, especially since 2020. So maybe there are some different conversations that need to be had in terms of what's the traditional academia, which is really Western Europe, white supremacy, patriarchal knowledge systems versus the people of the global majority who have different knowledge systems, different idea of what is good data, what does knowledge mean and how are those relationships? And I think that's community engagement, that's Jemez principles, but that may be a separate conversation, but just please, if we're gonna say expert, just know that there are some experts who don't have, don't have a bachelor's because they couldn't get to college for whatever reason or they got there and it was so racist. And if you're looking for marginalized community in science, there's a lot of us that are leaving and have left in the past two years. So you're not gonna find us if you're gonna look in academia, you're gonna have to look at nonprofits, you're gonna have to look at consulting places because academia is just not safe. So thank you. Mona, can I, can I ask your opinion on that? Cause we, I think out of the three people who've kind of been hosting and talking here, we've got three different levels of podcasting that are happening. So I think in general, podcasting is a bit of the wild, wild west because anyone can start and do it. So I, you know, my independent kind of business owner, I've got maybe a couple thousand coming in over the year so far. Um, so not much they can do in terms of compensation. Um, Sadie is working at a university and getting funding through the university. And then we have Rose, who's at a more, uh, I think, fulfilled and going forward like media company. Obviously, there's variation in how much we can compensate, and I agree, you know, financially, exactly what we should do. In your personal opinion or in your experience, like, would you think there's like a minimum to get paid, or do, is it context dependent for compensation? 
Well, I think it, I mean, obviously it depends on the organization, right? If, if it's, it's a one thing, if it's like an NPR and they've got tons of money, right? Obviously they should pay more than a smaller entity. But I would think if you're going to bring in, an, if you were going to pay an honorarium for someone, so like I have a doctorate in biology and a master's in public health, I would probably get a nice sizable honorarium from someone. So, but if someone in the community knows just as much as me, but doesn't have the degrees, they should get the same amount that you, that you would pay me. And so here I'm in Louisville, Kentucky. We're pushing back on a lot of the foundations, the charitable foundations and corporations who have put out all these statements about diversity. And we're saying you all can give these organizations funds to pay honorariums. They've got money, right? Because in 2020, when we were in the streets, all of a sudden they had, oh, we got 20 million to donate to this. And we're like, oh, so you've been sitting on it, right? So that's maybe where you can have some partnerships within the community and say, so like here it might be Humana and say like, hey, I have a podcast and I need to pay honorariums. And the podcast is about public health and you're a health insurance company. So let's sit down and see what we can do. But I would always say like, if, if you can pay an honorarium for me, for my knowledge, um, to come in and talk about endocrine disruption, then you know, also bring in how I can talk to you about what it's like to be a black woman in environmental justice and environmental racism, because that that is an expertise. Um, that's not academic, but it is an expertise. Expertise, great expertise. All right, I think so. Podcast Sadie has to go, but. Uh, in a couple of minutes, unfortunately. Um, I'm willing to hang around for probably like 10 more minutes to host. Rose, I don't know if you have a schedule that you need to hop off anytime soon, but. Um, uh, I don't think so. I'm also still reading the chat. Okay. Um, oh, did we have more questions in there that we missed? It looks like Sadie has a question. Okay. Sadie, back at you. Thanks. It's not, a, it's not a question. Thank you for that, Mariette. Um, it's a comment following up on what Monica was saying in your question about like how much. And so here I'm thinking about um, one of my dearest friends, his name is Edgar Villanueva and he's indigenous. And he wrote a book called Decolonizing Wealth and his background is in nonprofit. And the nonprofit world, um, philanthropy tends to give seven to 8% of whatever their annual budget is back to communities and less than 1% of that goes to indigenous populations. And I'm trying to remember off the top of my head, but I want to say he's proposing a new standard of what we consider minimal giving and that it should be way higher, 20, 25 percent, something like that. And in his book, he gives examples of companies and, you know, other philanth you know, philanthropies that have done that and are giving more of their wealth away. And so I think Monica's point, too, here of um, a lot of these organizations have a lot more then they're giving out, but it could be that something like that could be a principle so that depending on the podcast, it's, you know, it's proportional to sort of what's coming in. Cause I hear your point too, Ben, of you're only making several hundred versus several million, right? There's, it's proportional. And so I think that it's even just the gesture of it, of acknowledging that someone is giving whatever their resource is, um, and that that resource is an expertise, whether it's a lived experience or it's formalized in some sort of institution, it brings a value to the show that is then being shared with others and in turn sort of bringing revenue into that company. So I just wanted to add that comment of that might be sort of a tangible way to think about how much do we give if this is um, a framework that podcasts hopefully start moving towards and, and thinking about sort of the structure of how they organize themselves. Yeah, love it. Thanks for sharing. Um, other questions or comments? I'm just going to say that, unfortunately, I have to hop off. I have a, a university meeting that I have to attend. Um, but thank you, Rose, for your time. And thanks, Ben, for co-hosting with me. And you guys can find us on the Slack channel, obviously. Um, I really hope this conversation keeps going. And I wish I could stay, but I have to go to this university meeting. So um, yeah. Thanks, lady. See you all. <laughs>
for people who are interested in podcasting, any words or advice or anything that you want to share that we didn't cover so far? Hmm. Well, I guess one thing I'm thinking of is, you know, some, there's no rule, like, you know, some of the stuff I was saying was like, you know, the tape comes first. It's all about the tape. That's the science versus way, but your podcast could be your beautiful writing, you reading it and, and, you know, minimal tape. Like, I don't think that that's uh, nothing I said was like, you know, the law of gravity or whatever. Um, but Gimlet's very like, it's a place that's very like teaches that, that the tape comes first and that, um, so that's kind of what I've been taught, but, um, I've only ever worked at science in terms of audio. I've only worked at science versus. And so I, I often, I was just saying this to someone today, actually, like, I wonder how I would do if they plot me at an NPR show or pineapple street or neon hum, like I'm sure it's different there. And, and I, many people are make their own, like you guys, like many people in this call, you know, are their own independent podcast makers and do very well and do great work. Um, that's not my background, but, um, yeah, it's just whatever you think sounds great and is is the way to go. Perfect. Um, yeah, so no more questions. I guess we can call it here. I, you know, as mentioned before, I'm on Slack. Not that I'm an expert in everything audio, but happy to answer any questions um, that you might have um, regarding audio um, or podcasting. I'll try my very best. Um, Otherwise, Rose, thanks so much for being on here. Um, it was nice to see you behind the scenes and discuss some tape with you. Uh, sure. Yeah, thanks. thanks for your time. Everybody for being here and for your thoughtful um, questions and comments. I appreciate it. All right. Okie dokie. Uh, Tyler, any last announcements? <laughs>